Hey there gang, welcome back. I've got an Epiphone here to work on today. This is a 12 string from 1965. It's an FT85, the Serenator model, which was made in the Gibson factory, basically a clone of the Gibson B2512, uh, probably came off the same molds. They're very similar guitars, there's just a few cosmetic and design changes for the Epiphone model. Uh, they're both based on an LG2. They just stuck 12 strings on there and this great big bridge trying to control the string tension. Um, the smaller body it makes it a really balanced sound and I, I quite like these guitars. Though over the years I've seen a number that have collapsed pretty disastrously from string tension. This one though, it's holding its own. It's doing very well for itself. Top's in great shape. We're going to do a number of things to this guitar, most of them focusing on the bridge here. It's original. It was cut down at some point to make it possible to lower the action. Um, it's a, like a brown striped ebony. It's got all kinds of interesting figure here and a little patch of sapwood. It's also got a number of cracks that run through it, like uh, probably just cracks from dryness, although there's some that run through the bridge pin holes as well. So we're going to make sure that uh, those are stable. We're going to put some glue in those and maybe some sawdust and try to level about and make it look not so cracked. Um, the other thing is, this has had pins installed. Now all of these guitars, depending on the year, had either a tailpiece or they had a top loader style bridge, sort of like a classical tie block. The strings were inserted from the back and they ran over the saddle without going down into the soundboard. And you can see that there are two screws on either side of the pins here. Those originally ran through the tie block and down into the bridge. I think it was just, you know, trying to make sure it wasn't going to pop off at some point, trying to bolster it. Um, those have been left in place. Uh, I think I have some some dots that will fit in there so we can drill these out a little bit more and make them look a bit neater. Now the person who drilled the bridge pin holes had good intentions but either through the drilling or the reaming process they went off track a little bit here. Uh, they're all different heights and they're canted at different angles so I think we're going to try to make this look a little prettier and have them all sit down where they should and uh, make sure they fit properly. We'll also check out the bridge pad inside to make sure it's adequate for what's going on here. We have a pickup to install and the customer would also like a strap button. Now this is my friend Alfie who likes his strap to attach up here in the side rather than down in the heel so I'll have to make an interior support block that gives us enough material to run the screw into. Checking out the strings at the nut here, what's interesting is that some of those nut slots appear to have been left too high which is not what you really expect to find on a guitar of this vintage with what appears to be the original nut. Maybe they were filled at some point or it was shimmed up. Anyway, this is one of those things that goes a long way to making a 12 string play nicely. When you think about it, there's twice as many strings, so if there's excess height there, that can add a whole lot more tension to your hand when you're cording in first position. So, you know, if we get those dialed in right, this should be a much more enjoyable experience. There's a bit of a scuff here that runs across the top, right where your arm would be when you're playing and uh, we want to put some sealer on there to make sure that more sweat doesn't get in and perhaps lift the finish up. The other thing is this guitar, it's kind of dirty. Uh, I think it was a two-pack-a-day smoker for a lot of years and it's just kind of... We're going to do some cleaning. Now I don't quite know what's going on with this saddle here. It almost looks like someone took it out, flipped it around, uh, trying to get a better spacing or something. Because there are grooves cut into it that don't match up with what's here now or even what should be here. Um, the spacing in the course is a little free form. So I'm going to make a plug for this and put in a new bone saddle. We'll compensate it and endeavor to stick to one string spacing. Uh, you could get lost along the way when you're trying to play this. Now's a good time to check out the intonation while the strings are still on it because I'll have an opportunity to shift the saddle around and make things better. Um, what I'm finding is that the fretted notes are sharp, considerably sharp in the bass. Um, it's almost 10 cents sharp. This is in D. We expect this guitar is going to be tuned down for most of its life and it'll actually be an open tuning in Alfie's case. But um, that means that the saddle placement where it is now is too close to the nut. In order to play in tune, this whole thing has to move backwards slightly towards the pins. In an old guitar, this often happens when the body and the neck start to fold up together a little bit. The string length gets shorter and it eats up any compensation that was put into the design. It can also just be a misplaced saddle from the, the get-go. 
or even the takeoff points for the strings on the saddle. It pays to look closely and see where the string is actually touching it. In this case, um, it's pretty much in the center of the saddle all the way along. So, in order to make this play better, when I do make this new plug, I'll probably end up putting the saddle on the back edge of that plug rather than in the center. It's the kind of thing that if I went and just blindly followed this as a guide, when I came to put it together and strung it up again, it would be out of tune. So, good thing that we've discovered this now. In terms of action, we're sitting pretty good. The strings are almost exactly where I'd want them. I haven't tried to see whether there's any movement left in here. See if we can lower this down a little bit. And yeah, there is. So when I come to make the new saddle, it should be about the same height as this one. That's good. There is a large maple bridge pad present, which looks like it could be original. Usual hardware we'd expect to find. And this is one of those guitars with that kind of odd... Mm, they have extra X brace arms in this one um, that run parallel to the main X. Now they did some funny things in these guitars in terms of bracing later on in the decade. Um, sort of odd flying braces and stuff, but this one seems like it's in good shape. All those cloth linen patches on everything, that's original from the factory. So inside this thing has not been messed with too much, which is a good thing. Everything seems to be there. You will always be surprised at just how long these screws actually are. You gotta turn them for a lot of turns. It's just a simple job. The screw is somehow binding in the brass retainer that goes in here, and that retainer is loose on its post, so that by trying to back the screw out, it's actually loosening the nut inside, and uh, everything's turning together because the nut's thread direction is the same as the screws. So I've tried a number of things. I tried to basically hold it in place and unscrew. That did not work so well. I tried to actually glue it in with some super glue to keep it from revolving. That ain't happening either. So fun times. Vice grips next. The vice grips actually worked fine. I managed to hold on to the threaded insert pretty carefully on the inside of the guitar and turned out the screw. I'm scraping the accumulation of glue from the bottom of the slot. I'm going to try to make this good and flat so there's better contact between the bottom of the plug and the soundboard. And there's going to be a guy in the comment section who will basically say if it was his guitar he would pull out these brass plugs to improve the tone. And that's fine. If he wants me to do it to this one he has to send me some money. Because in order to do it you have to take off the bridge. In this case the bridge would dis probably disintegrate and uh, I'd have to build a new bridge. And if he wants me to do that, well I'll do it. But he's going to have to pay for it. I'm sure my customer will be thrilled. If you want to underwrite all of his repairs for some stranger's guitar, no problem. Let's get some glue in these cracks. want to make sure it goes all the way in there. Scrape it down and the second time we'll put some fill in. question arises, should I replace this bridge? And, you know, it's a delicate balance. It's a big bridge. If we can solidify these things and make them stable, I don't see why we can't just keep using this one. It's functioning fine. It's not coming off the guitar. I decided to drill the holes for the attachment screws a little bit deeper and install some pearl dots to hide them. This is uh, what the original guitar would have had, and it's the classic Gibson strategy. I don't happen to have any brown striped ebony on hand, so I'm just going with old-fashioned black gabon. Plane it to thickness. And measure the slots so we can ensure a good tight fit. More planing and a lot of checking.
Once the width is correct, I'll mark it to length and saw that off. And then I'll pair the ends so that they fit nicely into the radius in the pocket. I took some time to sand and scrape this so it's a really good fit. Snug all the way along. So you'd have a hard time pulling this out. Now this is the largest bridge I've ever tried to do this on. In fact it's so big it doesn't fit in the tray of my slotting jig. But I managed to level things off using stacks of paper here. Um, have to take into consideration the thickness of a rather, you know, big pick guard there, and just the tendency for the jig to want to tip on the surface of the bridge. But I've got it down; it's locked in secure, and uh, I've set up the bit here. I'll be removing the slot. Will uh, basically take off the plug material to the back edge of the original slot here. Um, which I think is as close as I'd want to get to those uh, bridge pins on the base side. And, uh, yeah, let's see how this goes. After sanding, I'll use some Danish oil to bring up the color. Here I'm working on the interior support for the strap button in the upper bout, making things kind of triangulated. So this will get pulled into place using a guitar string from outside the body running through the screw hole. I'm using a pair of magnets to figure out where the end of the neck block lies in here so that uh, I won't be running afoul of it. And I've got a pretty good location here, I think. So I'll mark this in the center and we'll drill a hole. If you're crazy enough to use an electric drill, go slow and don't explode through the other side. Bad things could happen. I need to sand and carefully clean the surface for gluing. Applying some glue. Unfortunately, I lost the video of the thing I used to wind this up. It's basically a guitar tuner and a little block. There they are. I'm reusing the original end pin for this because I have to drill a hole for the installation of the pickup. I'm using a guide block to get started because there's already a little hole there. Once it's established I can get rid of that and just bore on through. How much cleaning should a guitar repair guy do? It's kind of a big question. I know there's some people who absolutely refuse to clean. Just like, you know what, I'm here to fix your guitar, you want it spotless, that's your job. And there are other people who can't let it out of their hands until it's actually been completely sanitized and everything. So, I'm kind of in the middle. If I have a minute or two, I'll do a perfunctory wipe down. If you ask me to clean it, I'll do my best. Um, just use lighter fluid usually. There's some really sticky guitars out there. I'll actually use a fine polishing compound on them. But lighter fluid does probably 90% of the work. You gotta watch out for your polishing cloth and or paper towel. Some of them are actually abrasive enough to leave scratches. Um, not usually a problem with me. I use Viva brand and they seem to be fine. One thing to consider when you're putting a sound hole pickup in these 60s Gibson guitars um, is they tend to have pretty thin fretboards, relatively speaking, and um, you can end up with some clearance issues. 
Now this one was previously installed in another guitar and we had extra thick cork padding on that one to make it work better. Uh, I'm probably going to have to remove that otherwise we'll have strings hitting the tops of the magnets. I set up the saddle, figured out the spacing, cut it, filed it, worked on it a lot, brought it to the right height. You know the drill. Here's a quick coat of sealer for the bare spots in that scratch. The saddle looked too new, so I'm doing a bit of a die job. So the saddle now has the right amount of dinge to it. It's more appropriate for a 50 year old guitar. I like how the bridge pins turned out. They're closer to the same height now, and they're much less divergent. Um, the cracks have healed themselves up mostly and it doesn't appear like a broken thing anymore. Um, I don't know how much the bridge was lowered when they did the conversion to pins, uh, but we've ended up with a good amount of saddle height exposed there. Excellent brake angle. So this thing definitely won't require a neck reset anytime soon. And that's kind of a rare for a 1960s 12 string. Setting one of these things up always takes way longer than you think it will. There's a lot of stringing and unstringing and adjusting, especially when you're doing a compensated saddle like this. But uh, at the end of the day, it was worth it. This thing has a great voice. I like this guitar a lot.